So the starting point for this talk is that the Rust compiler is slower than we would like. Thanks to a lot of work by many people, it's about mm, three times faster than it was when I first started working on it in 2016, but people still complain. Unfortunately, speedups are getting harder to find. Today, if a new contributor says, how can I help with compiler speed? I don't really have a good answer because all the low-hanging fruit is gone. There are no easy optimization tasks left. But there is one large piece of high-hanging fruit, which is parallel execution. Now today, when you compile your Rust code, you're already getting quite a bit of parallel execution. The first form is inter-process parallel execution. When you run cargo build, cargo will launch multiple Rust C processes, compiling multiple crates in parallel. This works well. Try compiling a large Rust program from scratch with the dash J1 flag, and it'll probably take a lot longer than normal. But how well it works depends on the shape of the crate dependency graph. You can visualize this if you run cargo build with the dash dash timings flag. It produces a chart that shows how all your crates were compiled. This image shows the first 31 crates compiled while building rip grep. Each line represents a different Rust C process. If two crates are independent, they can be compiled in parallel. And in this image, there are no dependencies between crates until we get to the last few at the bottom. This run was done on a machine with 28 virtual cores, and you can see that there is enough parallelism here to keep it fully occupied. Now, this second image shows the last 31 crates compiled for the same program. There are a lot more dependencies between these crates. Now, now the, co the compiler can overlap compilation of dependent crates somewhat, thanks to a feature called pipelining. But even still, there is much less parallel execution happening towards the end of compilation. And this is typical for large Rust programs. So cargo will only take us some of the way. For more speed, we want parallel execution within each process. So this takes us to the second form of parallel execution in the compiler backend. The compiler's front end produces multiple chunks of LLVM IR, which are called code gen units. The compiler's back end uses LLVM to process these in parallel on multiple threads. This is more fine-grained than the inter-process parallel execution we saw before, but it is still fairly coarse. Let's see it in action. This is a screenshot from a profiler called Sampley. Each horizontal line represents a thread's execution over time. The bottom line is the main thread. On the left side of the vertical red line, you can see the front end is running on the main thread by itself. On the right side of the red line, you can see 16 threads that are created for LLVM code generation. And these provide a good amount of parallel execution. So the back end is already covered. Now we want to introduce parallel execution to the front end. Now the code, there's code for this that has actually existed for several years. And a lot of it was written by a contributor named Zox C. The code uses Rayon to produce very fine-grained parallel execution. But the Rust compiler that ships today does not have this parallel front-end code built into it. If you want to use it, you must build the compiler yourself with a special flag set in the config.toml file. And even then, the compiler front-end runs single-threaded by default. You need to use the dash Z threads flag to turn on multi-threading. And at this point, you might be wondering how all this works. The compiler has an internal crate that defines several important operations that enable parallel execution. These have familiar names like join, parallel, par iter, and par for each. In the parallel front end, these operations use Rayon to execute code in parallel. In the serial front end, these operations degenerate to serial execution. And these operations are used at certain key places in the compiler where parallelism is available. The same internal crate also defines several types that support parallel execution. Each one also has two implementations. The parallel version of each type provides, provides some kind of synchronization. The serial version does not. For example, we have a reference counting type called LRC. In the parallel front end, it's a wrapper around ARC. And in the serial front end, it falls back to a wrapper around RC. We also have locking types. 
in the parallel front end, they are wrappers around mutex and RW lock. In the serial front end, they fall back to ref cell. And there is a similar story for atomic types and iterators. And finally, in the parallel front end, we also split some global hash tables into multiple shards to reduce mutex contention. So that gives you a rough idea how the front end parallel execution works. This is a big change to the compiler and has some risk, so we need to be careful with our shipping strategy. Right now, the shipped compiler front end is serial. Step one of this strategy is to ship the parallel front end in nightly, but still run single threaded by default. That way, enthusiastic users can try it with multiple threads just by setting the dash Z threads flag. And this is the step we're currently working on. One wrinkle is that the single threaded parallel front end is unavoidably slower than the serial front end, but we want that overhaul overhead to be as small as possible. A couple of months ago, this overhead made the compiler about 6% slower on average. Today, that number is closer to 2%, which we think is probably acceptable. There are still some bugs to fix as well, but we hope to ship step one in nightly in June. A contributor named Sparrow Lee is doing most of this work. And then after that, step two would be to change the default number of threads to something greater than one, which will make the stable compiler's front end parallel by default. The timeline for this step is uh, not yet decided. There is another comp complication, though. We do a lot of performance tracking for the compiler. We have a comprehensive benchmark suite that is run on every merge, and people regularly triage the results to catch regressions. And the complication is that the parallel front end makes this harder. First of all, it means we need more measurements. We currently have over 40 programs in the benchmark suite, and we measure each benchmark in multiple ways. First, there are four different profiles, check, debug, opt, and doc. And second, there are multiple scenarios relating to different ways of using or not using incremental compilation. This means we measure between 10 and 13 compiler runs for most of the benchmarks. The parallel front end potentially adds an extra di dimension of measurement which is the number of threads. If we measure multiple different thread counts, the suite will run more slowly. It also means that there are more measurements to interpret when deciding if a change is an improvement or a regression. Now, you might think these problems are relevant for the parallel execution already present in the back end, but that's mostly handled by LLVM, and we only update the LLVM version every once in a while. In contrast, the front end code is changed every day. And there's also another performance with performance tracking, another problem with performance tracking. Parallel execution in the front end makes the choice of which performance metrics to use more difficult. So wall time is the most obvious metric because it measures what users directly perceive, but it has high variance, which makes it hard to detect small changes in performance. So the, our primary metric for performance tracking is instead the number of instructions executed, which has much lower variance. Now, this is a poor choice as a performance metric in the general case, but it works well when most comparisons are between two extremely similar versions of the same program. But that basically assumes serial execution. With fine-grained parallel execution in the front end, the usefulness of instruction counts is less clear, and time will tell if the current approach will need adjusting. So to summarize, I've talked about three kinds of parallel execution when compiling Rust code. We already have inter-process parallel execution via cargo. We already have intra-process parallel execution in the back end. And we're working on parallel execution in the front end. And we hope the first version of this will ship in nightly in the next month. Thank you. Who's got questions? Okay, that's uh, quite a ways up. Let's see how far I can get. <laughs> um, could you go back to the slide with the, um, uh, the code gen units parallelism, the yellow chart? What 
is the reason for this stair step pattern? Is that just the overhead of trying to spawn each thread one at a time? Yes, so I think the question is about why is there that staggered staircase shape? Yeah, yeah. so the, 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 I believe the main thread is spawning off those one at a time and having to do a bit of work each time. And um, so that's actually the current serial compiler. If you look at, if you, if you have the parallel front end enabled, like the first, say you've got eight threads enabled, the, the, the first eight of those staggered steps actually end up getting all shoved to the left because the, because the front end itself is then parallel, it can spawn off eight of those immediately or almost immediately. Right. And so, uh, but, but I was thinking, could, could this be changed without, without needing to make any other changes to the compiler? Could these threads be spawned ahead of time in the front end so that by the time we get to the back end, they're ready to run? Um, so I'm not sure if it's the, the, the spawning time that's the problem, but, but there's a certain amount of work preparing the cogen unit or something else. Um, I mean, I don't know. I only just discovered this graph like a couple of days ago, and so I was quite intrigued by it too, and I want to do a little bit more investigation to see if there is some room for improvement. That's great. Thank you. You want to throw it? Where's it? There's one over there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, is the resulting binary the same between the serial compiled and the parallel compiled? Sorry, I didn't catch so that. The, the result, uh, so you compile with your release build, and is there a difference in the resulting binary between the one you compiled with the serial front end or with the parallel front end? I see. So will the resulting binary be different yeah. depending on which version of the compiler you, compiler you use? I think, at the top of my head, I think there should not be a difference. <coughs> yes. um, so you said that benchmarking this is quite difficult, of course, the, 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 the parallel version, and um, uh, but you'd mentioned that, that only single threaded, a single threaded version of the parallel compiler might be about 2% slower. Is there any indication how much faster a parallel front end will, like rough numbers, right? Yeah, it's, it's not as good as you might hope at the moment. Okay. It's like, <laughs> sometimes it's slower. It, uh, well, first of all, it depends on how many threads you try, two, four, eight, or whatever. Um, for the moment, we're sort of, I'm focusing on smaller numbers because, mm -hmm. you know, let's not get worry about 64 until we're getting two or four to be good. Um, sometimes it's, you know, on a good case, it might be 10 or 20% faster. Sometimes it's slower, but I think really, we need to get that step one and get, get much wider, wider use of it because the fact that you have to build it yourself means that it's getting very, very little use. And so I think that's an important first step to... And then maybe more optimizations are possible. More people can try it out. Yeah. We get more feedback about which, which cases it works well with and so on. So. Thank you. Um, all right. If you could go back to the uh, slide with the decrease in uh, compilation time. It was at the very beginning. Yeah, there we go. I was kind of wondering what happened between version 1.52 and 1.55? The, where the orange one goes like that? Yeah. I think that was a, one of the releases where incremental compilation was disabled due to bugs. Oh, okay. Yeah, because that I makes think, a lot uh, of sense. Yeah, I think the, uh, the blue one is not incremental, so it, it, was, it, it was unchanged, yeah. and the other three were different forms of incremental. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Thanks. You can throw it there if you want. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Yeah, yeah, you'll be fine. See? <laughs> Thank you for the talk. Yeah, it's, um, it's good that it's soft, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so uh, thanks for the talk. So in relation to the other talk before where we talked a little bit about the holy envy, have uh, the team considered looking at other approaches and maybe doing a larger re-architecture? The um, reason I'm bringing this up is there is the Jai programming language by Jonathan Blow where he architectured his compiler from the ground up to use work stealing basically so that whenever it's waiting for a type resolution or all kinds of different things throughout the compilation process it can pick up some other work until that's you know resolved essentially in a future style um has there any consideration around doing something like that yeah it's a fair question um it's not something i'm, I'm i tend to be a person who's like really good at 
<laughs> squeezing the small wins and then other people are like the big picture, let's rewrite it from scratch kind of people. Um, and I'm not that sort of person. So th th there are certainly ideas. You can do things like, you know, let's start at the end and work out exactly what only compile the functions that are going to end up in the final binary and that way, you know, because you can imagine a, a lot of, you know, a lot of library crates, you compile a bunch of stuff and then the final binary only uses a small fraction of that. And so like trying to do sort of a data flow backwards kind of thing is, is an idea that has come up. Um, and, and really incremental compilation was meant to be like the big thing, right? And it's sort of like, it works reasonably well, but uh, there's also some problems with it. Um, so it's not something I've given a lot of thought to. And, and, and given that th this, this exists and it kind of works more or less, um, it's kind of the one we're going with now. And but the compiler's a big program and like that sort of re-architecture -arch would be a, a multi-year thing, um, which is a challenge to think about. Thank you. Uh, two more questions. So, well, first of all, thank you for your hard work improving the compiler because even though we still complain. <laughs> with all these uh, regular blog posts, uh, how to speed up the Rust compiler and all that. So um, I was recently working on the uh, Quinn library together with Dirk Jan. And we were discussing whether a particular change was uh, beneficial for performance. Because right now, uh, the, the library doesn't have a, Maybe, um, let's say the way the comp you're doing it with the compiler, it's very uh, structured and uh, there's this infrastructure you have put in there to uh, assess the impact of changes. What would you advise uh, for, um, well, as a starting point to, for library authors who want to uh, incorporate that in their workflow? So you're asking about if you want to do performance tracking for yourself, like how yes, uh, let's, let's, there's a huge, there's lots of libraries uh, in the ecosystem that would probably benefit from it. Yep. But it seems like a very. Um, it's a very intimidating topic, and 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 people have very strong opinions about what's the right way to do it and the wrong way to do it. My my take is that mediocre performance tracking is a lot better than no performance tracking. I mean, you can if you do it completely the wrong way, then yes, you'll end up wasting time but even if you do something that's okay and just start with something that's okay and like the, the one that we have has has evolved over the years and the choice of benchmarks has changed and the metrics have changed and so on but you got to start somewhere so just get something that seems okay start there see how it goes see if it feels like it's actually making a difference and then gradually try to improve it that's that's what I would do thank you Um, so this flag that you mentioned at the beginning, we have to build our own compiler to try it out and actually see if there's a difference. Is there any other thing where people can, uh, any other flag where we can try out the difference and provide feedback on whether it improves or not? Um, so the config.toml file which dictates how the compiler is built has lots of things in it. Um, I've, I've, it's probably got dozens and dozens, maybe even over a hundred different things, and oh, I've only seen, you know, some small fraction of them. So the answer is yes. Um, whether or not, uh, how many of these would be interesting to sort of general, general people, I don't know. But if you do actually want to just look at the code, it's in the root directory. It's called, there's one called config.example.toml. I think it's got all of them in it, and it's got, each one's got like a comment explaining what this flag does. So if you want to check that out, you can can do that. But in the non-nightly, in the stable channel, there's no like similar uh, other flag that you would appreciate feedback on? on uh, none that I am interested in, but um, there might be other people, other <laughs> compiler developers who, who, who uh, have flags that they're interested in. All right, let's end there. Thanks, Nicholas.